Main title. My mother-in-law's car, right? She's already mad at me because I'm not a dentist. You've been a cop for like 15 years or more. Not only is being mad you're not a dentist f***ing stupid and not worth your anxiety, it's also a 15-year-old issue. Also, John goes with this mother-in-law bullshit before just showing his I'm also a cop badge. Also, the movie makes it seem like this guy is bad because he's giving McLean a ticket for parking here. But f*** John McLean and his thinks he can park anywhere he goddamn pleases ass. You go ahead. Boys and girls, this is called a pager, and for about 15 years, they were f***ing vital communication tools, if you wanted to score wheat. The studio said, yes, we must keep all the elements of the original Die Hard in this sequel, right down to making it Christmas again. Regular Joes in Indiana won't be able to tell this is Die Hard without the Christmas. Thank you, Fred. Leonard Atkins is in a warmer climb with a story that grows hotter by the minute. A warmer climb? This reporter's posture and speaking cadence? Overwritten. Overacted. That's the movie news difference. Your movie's primary villain is clearly not to be trifled with because he does his exercise naked. Also, the nudity is a choice, right? I mean, there's nothing inherent in the stretches and poses he's doing where nudity would actually make it better for his body, right? I'm trying to figure out if the movie just went with the nudity for their show the bad guy is creepy evidence, or if pre-fame William Sadler had a must-have nudity clause in his contract. Really, this is probably the most nudity-infused expositional scene in all of movie history. And oh look, this news is extremely helpful in showing us that Esperanza and Stewart had dealings with each other in the past. Their next news story, how to light up airport runways with fire when the power goes out. Could be helpful later, you never know. Seriously guys, don't f*** with the man who has the fastest remote control quick draw in the entire world. This guy means f***ing business, y'all. Stewart and his henchmen timed their hotel room exits to coincide with other bad guys walking in the same direction so that it would look cooler and look more menacing. Let's be honest, if you assholes coordinated your watches as you should have, then you'd have all come out of your rooms at once and not in this cinematically staggered manner. I like how these assholes are all in matching military-style jackets, marching in unison like soldiers, and each carrying similarly suspicious Christmas presents. Yet to them, they've planned the perfect cover, and it works. American Airlines. Of course, this movie would find a way to put Holly on a plane so she can be a damsel in distress again and give John proper motivation to die hard. Isn't technology wonderful? I zap any bastard that screws with me. This woman brings up technology merely as an excuse to pull out her taser on an airplane, which, yes, we'll figure into the plot later, and even in 1990, I can't believe she was allowed to have. I tried it on my little dog. Because I'm an asshole? F you, Granny. I mean, what the f***? McLean just happens to bump into the main bad guy early in the movie, because this action movie is the equivalent of your cousin's sloppy attempt at poetry, and Dulles is a huge airport. The odds these two would bump into each other are like lottery winning levels. Well, oh, you look really familiar to me. Let's just pause for a second, because just after this McLean Stewart interaction inside the airport, we're going to cut to Stewart's men way outside the airport, taking over the nearby church they will use as their base for the entire movie. And my question is, why the f is Carl Stewart in the airport at all? I love how this tiny-ass church near the airport has a full-time night watchman, and that he's got all the snacks and drinks possible within an arm's reach. Where deposed General Ramon Esperanza has just arrived under heavy guard. There's no way this story would be this big of a deal and on the news constantly. We're checking our equipment. Any problems with the conduit line in your backyard? Movies will have you believe that people just accept any workers into a place, even if they haven't called them or know of a problem. This is buckwheat. The clubhouse is open. Terrorists using Lil Rascal's names as call signs. Apparently Dulles not only has a huge bank of modern-day phones in one area, but they also have old-timey phone booths still set up in another part of the airport for people who'd like to report on Al Capone's bootlegging trial. Also, these assholes who perfectly coordinated a hotel checkout march somehow still need an in-airport phone call to ensure all is well with their plan. Thankfully for this movie and intuition in general, John sees dude remove his secret earpiece and sees other dude kick a mysterious package closer to the first dude. I mean, is McLean the most observant motherfucker ever or what? Also, okay, so this movie, which is telling me all the bad guys were in the same hotel earlier, still has one bad guy suspiciously pass a package to another at the airport for some reason. Probably so McLean could see it, which was kind of them. John sees this asshole and later follows him into the baggage room. And if not for this huge leap in logic by John, after a hugely convenient I think that guy is suspicious moment, the rest of this movie couldn't happen. Yeah. A key for this door? Yeah, why? Because I want you to open it up. McLean thinks that just by asking for a key, people should just hand that shit over. He looks annoyed he even has to pull out his badge for this. The bad guys can somehow hijack an entire airport from a remote location, but needed to put some sort of signal in the luggage area in order to tap into the control tower communications. You know, because this movie needed a quick action scene and a few crumbs of evidence for McLean to follow. McLean, regular cop, will now defeat this special forces ninja guy. This is a tag team? Um, yeah. You attack two bad guys at once. The probability is that the two bad guys will fight you at the same time. Your action movie one-liner is dumber than usual. Convenient abandoned cart of luggage is abandoned. Convenient abandoned mail bikes are mail bikes. Sure, he tackled the bad guy, but how many of these bags ultimately got lost? I'm guessing half of them. All you do is shove me back here in this cattle car. Somehow, Thornburg is just now being told to leave first class, even though this plane supposedly lands in 30 minutes or so. Also, the odds that this news guy from the first movie and McLean's wife, both of whom were LA natives last we saw them, would be on the exact same plane approaching DC is some fucking bullshit. 
Also, this is the first time they've noticed each other, even though they were probably in the same waiting area to get on the plane and likely passed each other during the boarding of the plane. I'm not allowed within 50 feet of him. 50 yards. So by keeping me in this section, you are violating a court order. Actually, asshole, it would be in violation anywhere on this plane. Honestly, though, it's more of a violation of our suspension of disbelief than a restraining order. This is a crime scene. You gotta seal this area off, for Christ's sake. That's up to the captain. The only reason this movie is possible is because the cops at Dulles are the worst cops in human history. You fail me again, and the chamber won't be empty. Seriously, can someone explain that bad guy kills his henchmen because they failed him, even if something completely unexpected came up? Movie trope. Is it to show that the guy is so determined and evil that he's determined to be evil? Yeah, yeah, I know who you are. You're the asshole that just broke seven FAA and five District of Columbia regulations. But amazingly, McLean actually had to tell one of your cops to bring him here, despite breaking all of those rules. Also, overly biased against John, airport cop boss is overly biased against John. I got a f***ing reindeer flying in here from the f***ing petting zoo, but... John McClane, he's got a little problem. So your reindeer from the petting zoo trumps the dead guy in the luggage area? Yeah, yeah, I know all about you and that Nakatomi thing in LA. It might make me want to believe you when something like this goes down, but I'd much rather be the black hole that nearly drags this movie into unwatchability. What sets off the metal detectors first? The lead in your ass or the shit in your brains? The lead in his ass, of course. I need to borrow this and this. Bring it right back. Which just happened to be within reaching distance and also I'm an asshole. After getting bitched out by the airport police chief, and then running to an airline terminal, McLean still has enough time to catch up to the dudes wheeling away the body of the guy he shot in the baggage room. Movie finds a way to get Al Powell back into the action, complete with a comical pile of Twinkies. Now, you're not pissing in somebody's pool, are you? Yeah, and I'm fresh out of chlorine. So many questions. If you're pissing in somebody's pool, would you even bother with the chlorine? And would it help? And the f Say I close in about an hour. Can you go get a drink? Airport clerk is instantly smitten with John McClane because he stole her ink pad and paper earlier. And somehow she didn't see the wedding ring that John so proudly displays after this. Or did she? Just the facts, man. Hardy har, hilarious pun is hilarious. McLean finds his way into the control tower because, yeah, I guess I should just accept this at this point. L.A., Mr. Trudeau, don't mean sh Yeah, that's what I said about my last cholesterol test. Who wrote this? Looking, looking, oh, same guy who wrote the first Die Hard and some other guy. I'm gonna blame the other guy, whose credits include Bad Boys, Money Train, and the movie that forced Gene Hackman into retirement, Welcome to Mooseport, for all the kinds of silly that's in this movie. Looks cool for a movie, but what the f is he blowtorching on this electrical board? I mean, f burning wires might make f break, but it won't make any f work. This is the resume of a professional mercenary. You got the world's biggest drug dealer on his way here now. What do you need, a slide rule to figure this out? My brain is still stuck on that lead in your ass or sh in your brains line, but this using a slide rule to figure out an airport mystery literally physically hurt my brain. Hey, pal, you're the one that gave us that f***ing body. Remember that. Dennis Franz, NYPD Blue Audition Tape, ladies and gentlemen. After that, those planes low on fuel aren't going to be circling. They're going to be dropping on the White House lawn. Great line, but Dulles is more than an hour outside of the D.C. metro area, so those planes will be dropping on Virginia and not much else. Foreign Military One. Now, I'm sure you gentlemen are well aware of the unique nature Esperanza. of this flight. If it wasn't clear before, the circumstances for the plot of this movie are incredible. A high-profile drug lord is getting sent to the U.S., and it's all over the news. But Dulles didn't beef up their security at all. In fact, it's absolutely stunning there isn't a military presence around the airport with this kind of prisoner landing. Also, the U.S. decided, you know what, let's send this guy on Christmas, one of the busiest travel days of the year, and send him to Dulles. And not some private airstrip where we can take care of it. Jesus. Hey guys, want to go to Dulles and tour the control tower? They just let you walk in and wander around, apparently. Seriously, don't try this on your next trip to Washington. Also, why does this reporter think she's going to get anything from these people by doing the job this way? No guts, no glory, sure, but you actually thought this was a good idea? Lobby security, come in! The film shows two guys here working lobby security, but given this movie's track record, they should either be dead or passed out drunk, considering their level of aptitude so far. Come on, McLean, just a few words. Okay, just a few words. F*** off. Thanks, but I already got that from Colonel Stewart. Actually, he said f*** and you, but this franchise has never been good about remembering stuff like that. Another basement, another elevator. Look at the same shit happen to the same guy twice. Studio note that someone passed around when the idea of Die Hard 2 came up accidentally got into the screenplay. Also, did you say another basement? The f*** do you mean by that? You spent zero time last movie in a basement. Elevator, sure, but basement? F*** you. Also, how did he make it to the basement by crawling through the ceiling of an elevator that went to the top of a control tower? I guess the movie just wants John to be in whatever place he needs to be whenever it calls for it, and just forgets how it's possible. Thank God for this homeless asshole living and working beneath the airport who has access to blueprints and everything John needs. We are experiencing some technical problems here. Even if Trudeau isn't allowed to tell the pilots to divert, I am shocked there isn't a secret code or special message they can send to tell the pilots to fly away. All flights move to delayed, and yet this mass of people somehow doesn't riot. Again, John finds human-sized ventilation shafts where he can travel secretly. 
it's f***ing Christmas, but none of the SWAT guys or the radio guys stop to wonder why there are a few workers here painting the annex and sh <laughs> Quite honestly, guys, this shootout is so poorly constructed, I'm not sure who the bad guys are. And none of these guys are characters. I did see Robert Patrick a minute ago, and I know he's a bad guy because it's a movie, but in 1990, not even Robert Patrick knew who that was. Also, if this was supposed to be a SWAT team, they're the worst SWAT team ever, but that's pretty par for the course in this movie. For some reason, the T-1000 doesn't shoot this guy immediately. Jesus, how high a jump was that? And how the f*** is McLean uninjured by it? One of the Help Wanted ads for this movie read, One plastic dummy with many years of scaffolding collapsing experience. Looking real, optional. This guy just loaded this gun, but of course it jams when he has a chance to kill McLean. I'm gonna kick your f***ing ass. And instead of just picking up some dead dude's gun, he decides, I'll just kick his ass. Bait. Why didn't the bad guys just do this in the first place? You mean to tell me that the whole reason they didn't blow it up right away was so they could bait a SWAT team to come here just so they could kill them? To what end? If this SWAT team is killed, surely another one would be on its way, right? Make Lorenzo sacrifice his best men. Make you waste your time. Time we don't have. Well, there's the explanation, but considering you guys are operating from a secret location with a number of ex-military guys at your disposal, it's a total waste. And plus, they actually gave credit to this dumb airport that someone would actually think of the new antenna array and that Lorenzo would send his SWAT team there. But recalibrate sea level. Recalibrate sea level? Don't the planes have independent meters and gauges that are not reliant upon control towers to determine how far they are up in the air? Plane totally explodes after crashing because movie. John McClane assesses the damage from the comfort of a studio in its blue screen. That is your name. Deck. The reunion of Holly and Thornburg is really nothing but Holly insulting this guy, which is great, I guess, if you feel like Thornburg needs to be made fun of some more. But Jesus, how much abuse does William Atherton, the actor, have to put up with after these movies and Ghostbusters? Meanwhile, despite the fact that only one runway has been closed due to- This woman is either a terrible reporter or a terrible actress. I'm not comfortable picking between the two. Dino oh my! Get ready for some good times. This guy is in on it, and evil. My question is, how did the evil planners know for a fact this guy's squad would be called here? I mean, f***ing everything depends on it. But what if the general in charge decides, f*** it, let's send in this new SEAL Team 6 and see what they're made of? In Colonel Stewart, what are your men? No, not anymore, he's not. Yeah, but it's a conflict of interest. I mean, the f***. Things just get better or worse? Trudeau doesn't answer, but the movie's editing does. What about the airphone idea? There's 18 planes up there. Only five of them have those phones. We got through to three of them. And can't those three planes now communicate to the other planes through their radios? Hell, I know they can, because later the pilots of Holly's plane say this. Attention all air traffic on this frequency in Dulles area. So who says that radio signal has to just beep? Right. We switch the frequency from the tower over to the one in the beacon. We pump up the wattage. And we can talk to our planes, and those bastards who did this will never know. And that was the Maple Street acting troupe doing their favorite scene from Die Hard 2. Why is this military guy giving intel to McLean after McLean's already been banned from the investigation? Are they old army buddies? This is the only channel available to us. Bad guys who thought of everything somehow didn't plan for this outer marker beacon bullshit. Thankfully, Thornburg's AV guy actually kept listening to the outer beacon for hours in order to discover this message. On runway 15, repeat, 15. This is contrary to our instructions. We are to land at runway 10. If you have control over the entire airport, then why bother changing the runway and potentially tipping off the pilots that something isn't right? This aircraft carrying an international terrorist doesn't have any questions for Dulles Tower about the dozen other aircraft on its radar currently circling the airport. Neither of these pilots is in on the plan, and Esperanza has to take out a guard to get to this point. So what would have happened if he wasn't guarded by someone stupid? I guess the bad guys could overpower three people once they land, but it seems kind of like Esperanza absolutely needed to get free for this plan to work. In fact, seeing this sequence of events, it almost seems like this plan would have gone better if he hadn't freed himself. You mean to shoot me? So who will fight the plane? Don't worry about it. It's not your problem. Okay, so why didn't he just go ahead and do this then, if he can fly the plane? These assholes were able to sneak a radio onto this plane, which is coming from an entirely different country, and they were able to make sure Grant's platoon were the first responders when Dulles called the army for help, but apparently didn't have the power to get their own pilots on this thing in the first place. I've lost cabin pressure. Because I shot the pilot and co-pilot, and in doing so, shot out the window. It takes entirely too long for this plane to crush John. In fact, I think this is where Fast 6 got its runway length ideas. Bad guys just start spraying machine gun fire well before the recently landed general is out of the doorway. Also, McLean is standing in the doorway of the airplane, basically making himself the easiest target, but none of these guys with machine guns can hit him. I don't believe this. Two months of planning. Two months? That's all? To orchestrate a complete takeover of Dulles and have almost everything fall your way? McLean somehow survives this barrage of bullets. 
Then they decide to throw grenades into the cockpit, which gives McLean some idea that he needs to get the f*** out of there. They could have simply left them right outside the cockpit door and it would have accomplished everything, but everyone is dumb. These grenades take so long to blow, McLean is able to stupidly look at them for a long time, get the idea to eject, strap himself in, and eject before they blow up. These guys are running out of gas, but are now getting messages from Barnes in the tower, who is using the beacon. And it's impossible for the bad guys to crash planes anymore. So. Why can't they somehow get these guys to land already? Is it really just runway lights at this point? Can't they line up a whole bunch of emergency vehicles on the runway? And is it possible Stewart forgot to turn off the lights he turned on for Esperanza? The cabin attendants are turning on local Washington broadcasting. The sound is on channel three. Look, I know Dulles isn't telling anyone anything, but considering that a terrorist drug lord is being sent to Dulles, and there have been several major explosions on the runways, and there's a massive amount of press here, how is there no news about Dulles on the TV right now? You mean no one saw that shit or heard it? Come here, let me show you something. You better come take a look at this cliche. Also, this guy figured out where the terrorists are, but because of this f***ed up bureaucracy of an airport, he only feels comfortable sharing it with McLean, who is basically the Antichrist around here. This is our last possibility! Which means it'll be the one. Basic movie math tells me so. Could be a sentry. And he could just be out for a walk. And why is he going over his own footsteps? You can tell that from here? <laughs> Most inopportune phone call ever, though Leo in The Departed would beg to differ. Move it! Code red! Sit rep! We've got positive ID on Stewart's location. Dumbass Lorenzo doesn't ask how Grant heard that this was Stewart's location when he couldn't possibly have heard anything on this phone call. Also, this plan requires that someone figure out that they're in that church. If it's not for Barnes and McLean, there's no way this part of the plan happens, unless Grant somehow was planning to say, hmm, I've just got an amazing hunch where the bad guys are. To the church! Another problem, Colonel? No problem, General. Doesn't Esperanza know the plan? Doesn't he know the army guys out there are on his team? This random truck is driving around in the middle of nowhere. It came out of nowhere, and I'm pretty sure it's the truck where this screenplay was written. Colonel, you're quite capable of confirming it yourself. Grant still feels the need to prove he's a good guy to anyone listening to this broadcast for some reason. This recorder will play audio over an airphone, and it will have broadcast quality when it's played on the news. Grant's boys are gonna kill that son of a bitch and get it from him! They're gonna do that! They're gonna get on the same goddamn plane with him! McLean once again tries to make it sound like everyone knows the information he has, and starts making wild accusations without presenting the evidence. I'm adding 10 cents for this, because it may be the most reckless, stupid thing I've ever seen in a movie. McLean thinks that all the cops here will instantly recognize that he's shooting blanks and won't gun him down immediately for doing this. Simple English could have solved this problem. McLean goes with the ultra-dumb solution. By the way, it feels like this is exactly the reason why a news outfit wouldn't just broadcast Thornburg's message at the drop of a hat without figuring out the situation first. Lorenzo is able to drive this car immediately out of his parking spot, despite the fact that there are thousands of assholes escaping the airport right now. Hey! Call me! I'm sorry, there's just simply no way your voice would carry over this mob scene. Premature celebration. Also, this is very interesting. Even though about seven of their guys died, they filled every one of these seats in this getaway plane. Pretty goddamn unbelievable. John, what the f*** are you doing out on the wing of this plane? John would be excellent at cinema sins. You just get us in the air, General. You're the only man who can do it. But why? You got 20 people on this mission and nobody who could fly just in case? McLean and Grant fight on top of a wing of a moving airplane. And I'm just sitting here pondering what a dick physics is in almost every situation except this one. Nothing on this plane tells the guy the fuel dump was released or that he's losing massive amounts of fuel. yippee ki yay motherfucker. That is not how gas trails and fire work. <laughs> your f***ing landing light! Woo! Just in time, I guess. The f***ing plane Holly was on decided to emergency land like 10 minutes ago, right? Look! Look! Okay! I see it! I see it! Luckily, this plane was headed straight for this very runway. I'm no flight expert, but three planes all landing on the same runway right after another one just landed and another one on fire seems like a bad idea to me. Hey! Holly is John McClane's Adrian, and apparently necessary because he did this in the first movie. Why does this keep happening to us? Oh, come on. It's only been two Christmases in a row. That's a small sample size. You get this parking ticket in front of my airport? Yeah. Yeah, what the hell? Sure, you tore up the ticket, but the car was towed somewhere, and that's the worst part of it, right? Yes, it's true. This man has no dick. Good luck. I just want to tell you both. Good luck. We're all counting on you. There's the case! No, there's the case! You take that one, we'll take this one! Jim never has a second cup of coffee at home. This business will get out of control. It'll get out of control and we'll be lucky to live through it. 
Jack, next time you get a bright idea, you just put it in a memo. Stratogale, April 23rd, 57. Cape Cod in a jet turbine. Knock it!